in the novel. One of the explanations is that around, slightly before this, the Christian world becomes aware that there's an ancient Christian city in what is today Turkey, called Edessa, that possesses a, a peculiar relic. This relic is a, an image of Jesus that was not made by human hands. It's what they call a divinely made image of Jesus. Um, there are early records suggesting that the apostles themselves brought some mysterious object to the city of Edessa. The records are, from a historian's point of view, a little bit shaky. We can't exactly authenticate that these are legitimate rather than things that were written afterward. But there is a tradition in the city that something was brought there by the apostles. And by around 300 AD, we can be pretty sure they had some kind of image that they considered to be a divinely made image of Jesus himself. And once the, the rest of the, of the Christian world became familiar with this image, they were convinced enough to start painting all images of Jesus this way. But what really makes this interesting is that a historian about 30 years ago started to trace all the documents we have about this ancient relic from Edessa. <clears throat> and what he found was that if you trace it forward far enough, he was convinced that what was then called the image of Edessa is the relic that we today know as the Shroud of Turin. For those of you who may not be familiar with this or need a refresher, the Shroud of Turin is a length of linen cloth about 14 feet long and three and a half feet wide that appears to be the burial shroud of Jesus, the cloth in which his dead body was wrapped after he was crucified. And I say it appears to be it because it has on it an image, in fact two images, a front image and a back image, of a crucified man who has all of the wounds that correspond to the wounds Jesus suffered according to the Gospels. So either this is a miraculously made image of Jesus, or it's a very cleverly made forgery. And no one today has been able to tell exactly how the image is made, but in 1988, as some of you may remember, the Catholic Church decided that science was going to have its, its say also, and they sent the, a little sample of the Shroud of Turin to three different radiocarbon labs uh, in three Protestant countries, oddly enough. And they each, they, they all agreed. The results suggested that this um, linen cloth couldn't possibly be older than 700 years. It was a medieval fake. But the odd thing is that these historical documents about the Shroud go back before 700 years ago. In fact, we can trace them back to the 1200s and into the 1100s, and if you're willing to believe that this image of Edessa was the same as our Shroud of Turin, those documents go back e easily into the 500s and 400s AD. So the question that the novel arose out of was, where does this image idea come from? Why do we all think that Jesus looked like this? Did it, did it come from the Shroud of Turin? Is it possible that the Shroud of Turin is older than we think it is? But in order to write the novel, I made a fateful decision. The reason this took 10 years to write, or to research and write, was not that I chose that subject. It's that I decided that the best way to tell that story was through the eyes of a priest who lived inside the Vatican. Now, there have been many Vatican novels written. You may be familiar with some of them. And in fact, since I started writing this around the same time that um, the D word came out, um, the, my, I've got to tell you a little bit about, the, when the Rule of Four came out, it was incessantly compared to the Da Vinci Code, uh, which pleased Random House, my publisher, to no end, because it was great for sales, and which drove me and drove Dusty crazy. We had written the book with no knowledge of the Da Vinci Code. It had taken six years. Um, and, and here again, now, I was thinking that I was going to write a novel set at the Vatican right after the world was reading Angels and Demons. So the promise that I made to myself was, if I were really going to do this, it had to be the real thing. This couldn't be some imaginary version of the Vatican that came out of um, completely out of my mind. I was going to research this so well that, it, that if I were to hand it to a Vatican insider, that person would say, how did you know so much about this place? And oddly enough, that is exactly what has happened with this novel. Um, I've, had, I've gotten responses back from several members of the Catholic hierarchy who have said, I read this book on a lark. I never thought, I thought this was going to be another Da Vinci Code. And lo and behold, how did you do this? How is it possible that a layman found out so much about the inner workings of this place? Well, I'm going to walk you through that. Um, first of all, I, just to give you a sense of the, the overall process, I mentioned to some of you, I have three young sons at home. I was married shortly after The Rule of Four was published, and we had, my wife and I had our first child the following year. 
We had our second child two years later and our third child three years after that, which meant that for the decade I was writing this novel, we always had a little baby at home um, in diapers, and it was never really possible for me to say to my wife, honey, I'm going to go disappear off to Rome for work <laughs> for a few months. I'll be back. Um, so instead, it, that the circumstance of having a family and becoming a parent, had a, it had a lot of, um, a lot of uh, influence on the way that the book turned out. But one of the forms of the, that the influence took was that I could never really get to the Vatican and to do research myself in the way that I wanted to. So in order to fulfill my promise to myself about how deeply researched this would be, I had to start doing a lot of reading, and then I had to start calling priests. I'm not Catholic. And to be a novelist whose work is compared to the Da Vinci Code, calling priests and asking them about the Vatican shortly after the Da Vinci Code came out is a recipe for um, being hung up on uh, more often than not. And in fact, as if to make this project even harder, shortly afterward the newspapers were full of um, headlines about the priest abuse scandal. And one of the subjects, as you'll hear in a second, one of the subjects I, I needed to learn more about was the inner workings of the Catholic justice system, including these very secretive trials that most people aren't even aware exist. Well, little by little, I wore down a lot of these priests, and I convinced them that my intentions were good, that I had done my homework, and that my, all I planned to do with this novel was to fairly represent everything I learned about, about the Vatican. And the interesting thing that happened was that as one after another of them started to build, trust me, when they couldn't answer my questions, they would refer me to other priests higher up the ladder. So that I started out with some local priests who knew a little bit about some of the technical or historical questions I had, and then they started to refer me to priests who had been trained at the Vatican, and then to priests who worked at the Vatican, to the point that I now have traded emails with um, the director of ancient manuscripts at the Vatican Library, with the caretaker of the Shroud of Turin, uh, people I never thought I'd be able to get access to, and I never would have gotten access to if all I'd done was fly out to Rome and try to do some shoe leather research on my own. So what did I learn? Here's the content of this novel digested into a, into a small space. I'll, I'll talk to you about three different subjects. The first is the Vatican itself. What most people know about the Vatican is that it is the world's smallest country. It is its own independent nation. Uh, you may have heard that, um, that it's about the size of a golf course, for instance. It is 100 and acre, 108 acres in size. But what's interesting, it, it, it does have a lot of the trappings of a, of a nation. It, it, it um, issues its own passports. It has its own money. There are Vatican Euro coins. It has um, many, it has a national anthem. You never would have guessed this, a national flag. The cardinals at the Vatican like to joke about starting a national soccer team. So it does have a lot of the, the ordinary trappings of a country. But underneath the surface, what you don't learn in, in the Vatican books is that there's about a quarter of the country that is never really exposed to the media. And they do this, they'll, they'll let the media come and see the Vatican Gardens and St. Peter's Basilica and most of the Pope's palace, even including parts of the Pope's um, uh, private bedrooms, uh, his, his apartments. But they won't let you see a little corner of the country, and that's because not because there's some uh, diabolical secrets that they're, that they're preserving there, it's because there are families who live there. There are families of Vatican employees who live in an apartment building that's effectively just employee housing. And uh, the people who live there, live there not just by themselves as bachelors. You imagine the Vatican as a country of old men, celibate men sort of you know, wagging their fingers the way the woman here wagged her finger at me. Um, Instead, the reality is that this is a, a place where there are quite a few families who live, men who work for the Pope, the Pope's electrician, for instance, the Pope's gardener, the Pope's private messenger, we found out recently the Pope's butler. Um, they live inside this apartment uh, building with their wives and their children. Their entire nuclear families growing up inside the Vatican. They actually live in this... Um, it's, it's, you know, it, most people associate the Vatican with a certain amount of grandeur. The buildings have this mystique to them and this opulence and magnificence. And uh, I, part of me wonders if the reason they don't show this particular quarter of the Vatican is because it's full of the homeliest buildings in the entire country. Uh, the building where the employees live 
is a, a very unattractive looking little shoebox that they call the Belvedere Palace, which if you're familiar with what Belvedere means in Italian, it means good looking or nice view. There's a part of the Pope's own palace called the Belvedere, and it is in fact the, one of the nicest parts of the palace. It has a beautiful view. It's where he keeps his best statues. The employee housing called the Belvedere Palace is, uh, it looks like a, an old Soviet apartment building. So I don't know if that's irony or just this Vatican lack of sense of humor, uh, but that it has the same, the same name as part of the Pope's palace, um, much less luxurious though. What's interesting though is that inside the rest of this little neighborhood, you have a lot of the ecosystem of suburban life that most of us would be familiar with. You, you have a, there's a Vatican grocery store where if you live at the Vatican, this is where you get your groceries. You can go in there. I've gotten a lot of questions about what they sell at the Vatican grocery store, so I'll just preempt those now. Um, holy water. You, <laughs> holy water, I've gotten that. Um, you can buy, so for instance, if you buy a dozen eggs from the, uh, the Vatican grocery store, the eggs come from the Pope's chickens, and that's a true story. He has his own summer residence, uh, about 45 minutes south of Rome, and on that, it's actually bigger than the Vatican itself, and there he has olive trees from which are pressed olive oil, Vatican olive oil. Um, they, there are Vatican cows who produce the, the Vatican milk. There are Vatican chickens. The pontifical hen house is amazing. It, it is so much more impressive than the employee housing. Um, and, and they collect the eggs from the hens and they and bring them and, and sell them at the Vatican grocery store. You can buy all sorts of meat. You can buy wine. The wine at least used to be rationed. I'm not sure exactly if they're keeping an eye on it anymore. Um, and there are a couple of peculiar rules there. For instance, if you're a bishop or higher in the pecking order, you're allowed to cut to the front of the line. So the interesting thing, and this is true of many of these Vatican institutions. If you go to the Vatican Health Center, there's one door for bishops or higher, and there's a separate door for everybody else. Uh, if you go to the Vatican Pharmacy, in fact, I, when I was in Houston on this book tour, Monsignor took me to lunch and said, look, I've just got to tell you, I don't know how you did this, but even what you said about the Vatican Pharmacy is true. I was there buying cosmetics for my wife, tell you more about that later. And, um, and it's true, there's a separate line for bishops and a separate and, and then one for everybody else. And I got to cut to the front of the line because even though I'm just a Monsignor, I have the rank of bishop. Um, so the, uh, there is this persistent class dichotomy within the Vatican. But um, to return to this idea of this, of this little suburban neighborhood, if you grow up there, you, you, you shop at the Vatican grocery store, you, uh, your mom and dad deposit their checks at the Vatican bank, which most people know of only as this nefarious organization that perpetrates these global conspiracies. And it, it actually, they, there are little Vatican cash machines, ATMs, that operate in, in Latin. Um, <laughs> uh, you can select that as one of the options. It, the, um, there is also a Vatican department store. And the, What's very peculiar about the Vatican department store is it sells things that people on a Vatican, I, I've even found out what Vatican priests make, I've seen their paychecks, and um, they don't make enough to shop at the Vatican department store. The Vatican department store sells things like plasma TVs, and burglary handbags, and uh, luxury wristwatches. And the reason is, an American cardinal actually came up with this idea, they're trying to lure in some people to buy these luxury goods because there's no tax inside the Vatican. And then the profit comes to uh, help the Vatican uh, city-state's budget. They have all kinds of financial problems at the Vatican. So this was an attempt to balance the budget. Um, there's a Vatican gas station where you, uh, they, they carefully ration the gas because everybody wants to buy the tax-free gasoline there. Apparently, Italian petroleum taxes are astronomical. So if you're a kid growing up at the Vatican, this is the life you lead. You, uh, you meet with all the other Vatican kids at the Vatican gate every morning and they walk you out to your school and then in the afternoon you walk back and you live your life inside this apartment building and visiting these humdrum institutions of, uh, of daily life, grocery store, department store, gas station, bank. Um, and this was the first eye-opening moment for me. The idea that I could tell a story like this from the point of view of someone who lived inside the Vatican but was not the celibate priest, scholar, um, monk type that we all envision living in the Vatican. And people have the wackiest ideas about what the Vatican is really like. You know, it's a, it, all these tiny monastic cells and all the men return to them at night and make their prayers and, and, and silently go to bed. Um, it, it's, it's not like that. So the first revelation was I could tell a story about a family. 
That was powerful to me because, of course, at this point, I am a father myself. I am riveted by the idea of telling the story of being a dad because at this point, once you've had a kid or two, the thought of telling a long story about a celibate man just has no vitality to it anymore. <laughs> you know, here I am, my daily life is changing diapers and escaping from the crib without making a sound so the kid won't wake up, and, and I have to write about this guy who has no, no connection to any other human being except other priests. Fortunately, that's not the story I had to tell. So then I asked myself, well, is it possible to have my cake and eat it too? Can I tell this story from the point of view of a family, but also a priest? Are there any priestly families? Well, we've all heard about a couple of priestly families and <laughs> priests who sort of uh, on the sly go and get married, but are there any legitimate priestly families? And as I suggested in that story about the Monsignor who bought makeup for his wife, there are indeed uh, married Catholic priestly families. Um, by the way, the funny, the punchline of that story was he went up to the counter, and I'll explain to you in a second why he didn't expect anyone to understand why he had a wife, but he went up to the counter assuming that everyone else in the store would be scandalized to find out that he had a wife, so he said, I'm buying this for my mama, right, these, these Estee Lauder products. And the woman behind the desk at the Vatican Pharmacy looked at him sort of wryly and said, you don't have to lie anymore, Monsignor, we know you've got a wife. Um, so she was, you know, this is sort of the, um, they've, all, they've seen it all before, but the place is ancient as the Vatican, I guess they, they have really seen it all before. So who are these married priests? How can this exist since the, the Catholics we're all familiar with are celibate? The priests we're all familiar with are, are celibate. Well, if you imagine the, the Catholic Church as an institution of about 1.2 billion people, there are about 1.19 billion of them who are what we call Roman Catholics. That's an invented term. The Catholic Church itself would call them Western Catholics or Latin Rite Catholics. And for all of those Catholics, you, the priesthood is a celibate institution. But there are about 20 million Catholics who are Eastern Catholics. They belong to one of about two dozen different uh, hyphenated Catholic churches. For instance, uh, there are Ruthenian Catholics and Maronite Catholics and Chaldean Catholics. Um, I'll explain, I can explain in a quite in the Q&A session if you want to know more about them, where these traditions come from. But the idea is basically this. Western Christianity, the Christianity that we find in, um, from about Italy and westward, is one tradition within Christianity, but all of Eastern Europe and the Holy Land and, and Egypt formed its own traditions. And those traditions have been preserved today. They're just as ancient as Western Christianity's traditions. They're just different. And one of those traditions, which goes back to the Bible, is that if you are a married man, you can become a priest. You can be ordained. The Bible tells us, it's, this very, it's a very peculiar little verse. Uh, it's, it says that uh, St. Peter's mother-in-law had a fever, so Jesus healed her. Nowhere else in the Gospels is it mentioned that Peter had a wife, but we find out that his mother-in-law got sick and that Jesus healed her. So that's the little clue that says he was married before he became uh, a disciple. And so we have this Eastern tradition, legitim legitimized by the Bible, that if you're a married man, you can, become, you can be, still become a priest. The interesting thing, though, is that it doesn't work the other way around. If you are a priest, there's no precedent for becoming a married man, so you can't do that. So the, heart, the, 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 the cart has to come after the horse. If you try to do it the other way around, they won't let you. And I'll tell you in a second why that's significant. But the Eastern tradition is relatively unknown, even within, within Catholicism. You talk to most Roman Catholics, they have no idea that these Eastern Catholics exist. Most people have heard of Eastern Orthodox. That is the second largest Christian institution in the world after the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is the biggest with about 1.2 billion people. And the Orthodox Church, which is a sort of federation of individual national churches in Eastern Europe and Russia, um, that's about 300 million people. Most people have heard of, of the Orthodox Churches, but the Eastern Catholics are something different. And they, um, so the story that I ended up telling was a story of a married Eastern Catholic priest living inside the Vatican with his family, including his five-year-old son. So what's it like to be an Eastern Catholic priest? 
the deeper I got into my own experience of fatherhood, the more I wanted to find out. So I started calling Eastern priests and saying, I, I just got to know, will you, will you open up to me about your family life? Will you tell me what it's like? In fact, all the way back, tell me from day one how it's different to be an Eastern Catholic compared to a Roman Catholic. The stories I got back were amazing. So one of the, as many of you know, to become a priest, you go to a training school called seminary. And for American priests, for American Catholic priests, the Harvard of all seminaries is called the Pontifical North American College, which is located in Rome, actually on Vatican soil, on the hillside right next to the Vatican itself. <coughs> so I talked to some priests who trained there, including some Eastern Catholics, and the story they told was this. There are about 100 men who come every year. These are the, this is the creme de la creme. They're handpicked by the American bishops. Many of these men become the bishops and cardinals of tomorrow. And they, they're all sent out to Italy where they have to study for four years in Italian at some of the oldest Catholic universities in the world. And if you talk to the Roman Catholic men, they'll say, the hardest part was not the, class in, the classes I had to take. The hardest part was not having to say goodbye to mom and dad back in the States. The hardest part was not learning Italian. The hardest part was saying goodbye to my girlfriend back in Minnesota, right, Susie back in Minnesota, and then coming to terms with the reality that there will never be another Susie from Minnesota. The battle to, to live with celibacy, to accept that as a lifelong condition, is the biggest psychological battle of, of seminary for these Roman Catholic priests. So the interesting thing is that at the very moment that's the fight that they're fighting, the Eastern Catholic men, who are only about three to five of them per class, they're slipping out at night to go on dates. So it, what happens is that these men will, with the, you know, the, it's sort of this wink, wink, nudge, nudge situation with the administration of the seminary. It's not as though they're doing this illegally, but they don't want this to come to the attention of these poor Roman Catholic men who are just struggling with celibacy. So off they go at night and they date the daughters of other Eastern Catholic families. And the reason that they always go straight to the daughters of the Eastern Catholic families is not just because they share this unusual religious tradition, it's because a clock is ticking. And the clock, as I mentioned before, is that you have to get married before you get ordained. You get ordained not just at the end of your four years, the first time you get ordained is as a deacon in your third year, early in your third year of seminary. So now you've got these men who need to meet a woman, date her, and marry her basically in the first two years of seminary. So the daughters of the Eastern Catholic families know this. They understand that this is where things are heading. And, and they broker these very quick, or relatively quick, marriages. And um, it's actually funny. If you don't, if some of these men, if they don't succeed in getting married before the, the end of the second year, they take a year off from seminary just to date them and get married. Uh, and this is understood. This is part of the tradition. It's, uh, um, so what then is the experience of... But, oh, by the way, I have to include this. These Eastern Catholics, they, they feel like this is obviously the giant perk of being an Eastern Catholic. <laughs> However, the rest of their experience is very much that they feel that they're second-class citizens. They're outsiders within their own church. In a class of 100 men, if 95 of them are Roman Catholics, the entire seminary operates around the calendar and needs of the Roman <laughs> Catholic men. The Roman Catholics and Eastern Catholics don't even celebrate some holidays on the same days. They don't have the same traditions. So for instance, in December, in the lead up to Christmas, when Roman Catholics throughout Italy are celebrating and you know baking the panettone and it's sweets here and sweets there, the tradition in the Eastern Church is that you have a 40-day fast. So even in the seminary cafeteria, there are all of these delightful holiday foods, and the Eastern Catholic men can't eat any of them. So their experience is very much that they are on the short end of the stick. I asked them then, well, what's it like for you after you get married? Do you, how does the, the road diverge within the priesthood? How do you feel about the choice once you've lived with your wife, had children? What's that experience like? Well, the experience, as you might imagine, is that the the priests who, all priests live on a shoestring. They don't make a lot of money. Well, to live on a shoestring and have a wife and, and kids makes it much, much harder. So that these men will tell uh, these almost hair-raising stories about my parish 
won't, they, they'll figure out what the, the poverty line is and they'll pay me just above it. They'll figure out how much I need to make so that I'm not on food stamps and that's how much we get paid. Mm -hmm. And for every child that my wife and I have, we're paid an extra, I think one of them told me, an extra $120 per month. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a dad myself, I, I, I had to ask, well, how do, you, how do you make that work? And the answer, at that moment, uh, you get to a moment in the, in the interview where the priest, who has been answering all the questions, right? he's sitting next to his wife, she's been silent, he's been answering everything. Suddenly, he goes silent and realizes he doesn't know the answer to this question. When we get out of the realm of the church and into the realm of domestic finances or how to run a household, he's coming up a little short. So he turns to his wife, and suddenly, for the first time, she gets to tell her story. And in the Eastern tradition, priests' wives are known as presbyteras. So the presbytera will often say something like, we just, uh, we scrape by, I will find work wherever I can on the side. You know, at night maybe I do a little bit of knitting or stitching or a little bit of, of work that can raise a little bit of money in an acceptable way so that we can afford some of the things that father's salary alone wouldn't allow us to afford. She also will tell the story of how, if you imagine whatever the division of labor is in a modern American household, if the dad is pushing uh, the kid on the swing or cleaning up the mess that the kid left in the living room, if, his, if father's phone rings and there's a parishioner on the phone who says, my aunt Susan is sick in the hospital, father, can you go and pray with her? Or even just, hey father, can you come and bless my house? Father has to make a decision every time. Do I stop having this moment with my child in order to go serve my other family, my, my flock, or do I say no to my flock and have them wonder what kind of priest I am that I can't even meet their needs, their spiritual needs? Uh, and of course, often he makes the choice to go to his flock and, his, and the presbytera steps in and on her only night off or the, the hour of the week when she thought maybe she would get a, a, an hour away from her kids, she steps back in to assume those roles again because father has to go and tend to his, to his sheep. So in that way, it's a heart-wrenching story. And I wanted to bring some of that experience also into the novel. So this is not just the story of a priestly family living inside the Vatican. It's an exploration of what it means to be a priestly family and how priestly families survive day to day. Um, but the final element is this. As many of you know, this is a thriller. And I, um, my favorite part of almost all of these talks is when I, I mention, and this is not a spoiler since it's mentioned in the dust jacket, someone is killed in this book. Um, someone does die. And often I'll get someone who ra raises a hand and says, you said you did all this research and this is so authentic, and then within the first 25 pages, someone gets killed at the back. Now come on, how realistic is that? Well, I saw that question coming, so I did a lot of research on this subject too. And as it happens, this is a very underreported subject, um, it's not that uncommon for people to be killed at the Vatican. Um, one of the unusual things that happened in the course of the, the 10 years I was writing the book is that many newspapers started to put their archives online, which made it possible for me to search subjects that otherwise would have taken years in a library and that most people wouldn't have been interested in searching for to begin with, including crimes taking place on Vatican soil. So I made a timeline of Vatican crime reaching back to about 1870, which is when these records start to peter off into, um, into the darkness of, of sort of pre-modern history. And what I found was that some of the most outlandish and seemingly unbelievable things happen in, in uh, Vatican crime. Things that you would think couldn't exist anywhere except, outside, except in a Hollywood B movie, it happens at the Vatican. So for instance, an axe murderer. Do axe murderers really exist? Yes, they do. Uh, in the 1980s, the Italian police had to shoot an axe murderer who tried to come and kill Pope John Paul II at his summer residence. Um, the, there is a Vatican jail. People are shocked to hear this. It was established in the 1930s because a woman had walked into St. Peter's Basilica with a revolver in her purse and she tried to shoot an archbishop. Uh, a few years after that, a man walked in with a stiletto concealed in his clothes um, when he went to meet the Pope. There are numerous incidents, uh, numerous instances of, um, of homicide, of attempted homicide, uh, some of them very, very peculiar. And as you might imagine, a lot of these are because if you are a 
clinically insane person who wants to commit a crime in a um, in a fanciful or dramatic way, where better to do it than at the Vatican, right? In the world's biggest church or in the, uh, the a place where you're going to get the, the most attention possible. So you find that that pretty much every crime that happens there has an extra dimension of of flair or panache or peculiarity in a way that to be honest, I didn't even make that happen in the novel because I knew people would come back and say, that's not realistic. Actually, it is realistic. Some of the strangest crimes you will ever hear of uh, happen at the Vatican. I will, I'm happy to answer more questions about that if you have them. But the one last topic I want to bring to, uh, to my talk here tonight is what happens to you if you are arrested for a crime at the Vatican. So once the crime happens, we enter into this terra incognita of the Vatican criminal justice system. This is an area that took a lot of research because, as I mentioned, the internal court system of the Vatican is not something that priests wanted to talk to me about at all at a period when all of the headlines were about priestly abuse. The, the, the way that most people are familiar with the mere existence of this court system is that we found out that some priests who had abused children had been shuffled around and some of them had been evaluated in some way in a court that wasn't a, an American court, even though these were American priests. Well, that's the court system that we're talking about here. So here's how it works. If you are arrested for a crime on Vatican soil, you can be tried under, actually, Italian criminal law. They can just send you straight over to Italy. They can arrest you and try you under Vatican criminal law, which is very similar to Italian criminal law. By the way, when they arrested Pope Benedict's butler, if you saw any of the footage of the trial, that was a Vatican courtroom and a Vatican judge, but Vatic the Vatican's criminal law. Both of those are separate from the law of the church. The church has its own legal code, and it applies not just in the Vatican, but throughout the world. Every diocese in Catholicism, including every diocese in the United States, um, has a court. Now, most of the time, these courts exist to try marriage annulments. That's overwhelmingly what, uh, what the caseload is for these judges. But if you read the Code of Canon Law, which is the Catholic law book, and by the way, it's, I mean, it makes the Bible look like beach reading. It's enormous. It, it will go through all kinds of situations that, um, that it's designed to adjudicate. Some of them are very simple, things like if you are a, um, if you're a non-Catholic, or if you're a Catholic, can you marry a non-Catholic? If you run a Catholic school, can you hire a non-Catholic? If a priest tries to make money for himself by selling church property, how do we punish him for that? But there are also more serious crimes. If you attack the Pope, that's covered under canon law. Um, a peculiarity that I thought was irrelevant until recently was it talks about what if a Pope wants to retire. Um, that I thought could never happen, and lo and behold, here we are. Um, but one of the crimes that it covers is just murder, murder of anyone. Murder by itself, no matter who the victim might be, is a crime that can be tried under canon law. So what happens if you are tried for murder under canon law? What is a canon law trial like? It is very, very different from the criminal justice system that we're accustomed to. There is no struggle between the defense and the prosecution to present a more compelling version of events to convince the jury that one or the other is correct because there is no jury. And in fact, there are three judges who ask all the questions of all the witnesses who they decide to call. So the pro prosecution and the defense don't get to call their own witnesses, question their own witnesses. The judges do all of this. They're allowed to suggest questions, but the judges don't have to listen. They don't have to accept the suggestions. The accused appears in the courtroom on the day of his own deposition, but uh, is otherwise not present during the trial. He does not have the right to face his accuser. There is no presumption of innocence. You are not innocent until proven guilty. The judges have the right to make their own determination about where the truth lies. If the church itself has documents that could prove your innocence, and you try to subpoena them, the church has the right to just say no. They have to make a determination about whether greater harm is caused by releasing the information than by providing it, um, or rather by withholding it. So after all of, all of this is said and done, 
there are three possible verdicts that can come down. There, there's guilty and there's innocent, but there's also this middle verdict. The middle verdict is called accusations unproven. And what it basically translates to is the judges aren't really sure. They're not convinced that you are innocent. They're not convinced that you're guilty. And they don't think there's enough information to say which one you are. That middle verdict haunts priests. That is the verdict that dogs you for the rest of your life. Because it, what it effectively says is you weren't quite innocent. Right? There was just enough of, the, enough of a whiff of guilt about you to prevent the, the church itself from saying you were innocent. So for a priest to go through this process, we have to, you have to get your head around a completely different set of consequences. Nobody goes to prison because of canon law. If you lose your trial and you're convicted under canon law, even a murder, you, don't, you aren't sent to a prison. But if you're a priest and you're convicted, the punishments are very different. They have a very different significance to you. They can banish you. They can send you to any parish anywhere in the world to get you out of sight. They can bury the problem. They can excommun excommunicate you, but they can also do what we call defrocking, which is not a Catholic word. Catholics say you are dismissed from the clerical state. What that means is you don't get to be a priest anymore, but the technical meaning of it is this. Catholics believe that once you're made a priest, God made you a priest, so humans can't unmake you a priest. So instead of unmaking you a priest, what they actually do is they just pretend you don't exist. They say you're no longer allowed to do any of the things that priests do, and worse, the Catholics around you are not allowed to be near you if you attempt to do any of those things. They must shun you. They can no longer treat you in any way as though you belong to the priesthood. So for a priest, this is an existential punishment of a depth that most laymen can't really understand. When we talk about, about um, being defrocked, to us it's almost a slap on the wrist kind of punishment. But when you talk to priests, you realize the depth of this punishment. This is the kind of thing that drives men to suicide. So to put all those ingredients together, the fifth gospel then is a novel about a Vatican family that is under tremendous pressure because the murder has led to an investigation aimed at a suspect I won't mention with consequences that are much more profound but also very peculiar um, to us as laymen. It tries to answer that question that I mentioned at the beginning about the role of the Shroud of Turin in the history of the church and it provides, I think for the first time, evidence from the Bible itself based on what Catholic priests told me about the way they were taught to read the Bible that sheds light on the authenticity of the Shroud. So, with that in mind, I would like to open this up to all of you for any questions you might want to ask. Uh, yes, Yeah, uh, that's, that's what I, I have to ask it. Uh, I assume your book is pre-Pope Francis? Yes, <laughs> uh, well since I started researching the book during the papacy of John Paul II, it is, it's funny, it is now classified in bookstores as historical fiction sometimes. <laughs> I think. Well, it wasn't historical when I wrote it, but when I started researching, this was, uh, I, I researched John Paul to begin with, and this ended up a, a novel about his papacy. But yes, I did not expect when I started that uh, three popes would go by by the time I had right. finished. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so no, no, no Francis and right. no Benedict, although Ratzinger is in, in there, yeah, as mentioned. Sure. Yeah. How far up in the hierarchy did you get in terms of your research? I, I started out with priests and deacons at a local level, ended up, uh, and then they led me to... Um, some bishops who had trained at the Vatican, and then some others who had worked at the Vatican. I, so here's, okay, the answer is I'm not even sure. And the reason that I'm not sure is this. When I got to a certain point in my research about Catholic law, I was learning the system, not only through the books I had, but through an expert in the field who is writing, or has written a book on this subject for the Oxford University Press, and she said, we got to the point in our report where she said, look, I, I, I love what you're doing with this book, and I, I'm excited enough that I want to put you in touch with my teacher. But the deal is this. He's in Rome. I can't tell you who he is. I can't tell you what his job is. <laughs> but he's willing to read your pages on the subject of Catholic law and provide feedback on whether this is exactly how it would be done at the Vatican. And that is exactly what he did 
she served as the middlewoman in all of this, erasing all identifiable information from every email before sending it on to me. So to this day, I don't know who my secret high-ranking contact inside the, uh, the church court system is. Uh, I do have some guesses, but um, I, so I have communicated with, um, as I mentioned, some people at the Vatican Library, the Vatican Museums, um, at, in Turin, the caretaker of the Shroud, uh, and then I've sort of indirectly been in contact with with cardinals. Um, so I, I I have not gotten to the uh, some people ask so, the Pope, the Pope. No, I, I, <laughs> nothing from the Pope. I am not. Um, I haven't gotten any email from, from the Pope yet. <laughs> yes? Well, I, I got through the first 10 to 20 pages and am now hooked with this book. And I was convinced that you actually had somehow miraculously gotten inside the Vatican into this little neighborhood. I want to know if anyone who, any of the families who are living there now, managed to say anything. Because you went to the priest, you went to the clergy to get your information. Are they sworn to secrecy? Would they be thrown out of that neighborhood if they talk to you directly? Because it was this is so real. This is a very interesting question. So um, there are some documents in Italian, <clears throat> written by Italian journalists who knew some of the families well enough that they could get them to answer questions. And even though my Italian is not especially good, one of the th reasons this took so long is that I would scan entire books in Italian into uh, digital documents and have Google translate them for me. Um, so I have entire books that don't exist in English, except on my computer. Um, and a few of them talk about those families. But one of the interesting, so in general, they don't like to talk. And there is a sense that you don't open your mouth too wide at the Vatican. For instance, there's a widespread paranoia at the, Va at the Vatican about talking on the phone because they think their, phone, their phones are bugged. They think people are always listening to them and the consequences of being heard will be getting fired. And this does happen. People, um, rumors create scandal. The church's definition of scandal is that it's a, uh, this is actually the technical definition of scandal, by the way. Whenever the church has its own definition, it's usually the original. Um, it, it's that it's a, a stumbling block for others in their faith. So even if you are not proven guilty of, of uh, violating the code of conduct that they do have to sign when they become Vatican employees, yeah. you can unceremoniously, unceremoniously be transferred to a job outside the Vatican and everyone can be pretty sure that the reason is that you were, um, you said something you shouldn't have said, you offended someone you shouldn't have. An interesting example um, who I think is a woman who's gotten uh, flown under the radar a little bit is that there's a Swiss guard officer whose wife, he, he met a pilgrim, a, Pol a Polish pilgrim who had come to the Vatican and was in St. Peter's Square one day visiting, um, trying to see Pope John Paul II. They fell in love, they got married, and she moved in to the Swiss Guard barracks, which is inside Vatican walls, and is actually very telegenic and very shrewd and is, and is outspoken about discussing parts of her life inside the Vatican. And she will even say, I don't feel completely comfortable talking about some things. And in fact, even when I'm inside the Vatican, I don't always feel comfortable kissing my husband because I think there are video cameras everywhere. So there, I, I think in a way it's sad. They, some people inside this, the city feel paranoid. I, I, based on what I know about the Vatican, I, I think only very recently have they gotten to a technological state where they could hook up video cameras everywhere. I think it's possible that that does exist now. But um, I think for so long they have, there has been a culture of fear about being open, and earlier popes before John Paul and before the modern era were very much against that idea of openness, that that culture still sort of permeates the Vatican, and, and they're very reluctant to talk openly about their experiences. All right, maybe one more question? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, do you think the book will be translated into Italian for the Italian mm -hmm. market? It is, Ita it is being... It's already. Right. And, and so, well, here's the other nerve-wracking thing. So, um, the Italian uh, literary the publishing industry is in this parlous state where, yeah, I mean, just is really sad. The the Italian economy obviously hasn't um, been in great shape for a while now, and the literary uh, situation there is is depressing. Very few publishers want to take risks on publishing books, so they have gotten to the point where some of the publishers will take 
will take works that used to be published very reputably in Italian. You get a good translator, a very faithful rendition of your original cover and your original title, and now they'll decide that they want to, that they know their own market best, and so they retitle it, they give it their own jacket, okay. they sometimes just remove parts of the book that they won't print, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then they pay their translator the bare minimum. So you end up with this horror story of a yeah. book. And so I'm very nervous actually to find out what my what this book is going to look like in Italian because that's you can't contractually enforce some of the things. I'm, we're trying. Yeah. That's what my agent is trying to do right now. <laughs> and and the, my fear is, of course, I've worked with a lot of people in Italy now. Um, yeah. I mean, at one point I had the Vatican Library ship me books at home, yeah. and I don't want these people reading a, a, an awful version of this in Italian. I want them to to see um, that it that it turned out well, that mm. that their efforts at helping me. Um, mm -hmm. We're rewarded with a book that, that tries to do what a, no book has done before in treating the Vatican this way. Mm -hmm. Okay, any. I actually have one, just yes. quickly, because you mentioned earlier about the Vatican's financial problems, mm -hmm. and if there's any cliche about the Catholic Church, everyone thinks, oh my God, they're so rich. You know, uh -huh. they own all this artwork, they own all this property. You know, and this is before, you know, the Pope's butler, you know, and all that stuff, and a lot of corruption stuff started to come out. But can you just talk a little bit more about the, the Vatican's financial situation? Uh, yes, so I, to see it from the Vatican's point of view, there are three different groupings. They see sort of three different balance sheets. Okay. One is for the entire rest of the church outside the Vatican. To them, all of those, every diocese is under the control of its bishop. The Vatican, and of course this is a, a little bit um, smoke and mirrors because if the Pope tells a bishop to do something, the bishop does it. But um, So to them, each individual diocese in the world has its own balance sheet. And that's not the, the Vatican's, you know, to say that that's the Vatican's wealth, to, to add up all of the, the value of all the churches in the world and say that's what the, the Pope um, has at his disposal, to them that's invidious. Um, whether or not it is invidious is a different question, but that's their view. The Vatican view then is that there are two different budgets, one that belongs to the Vatican and one that belongs to the Holy See. So to them, many of you have heard these used interchangeably probably, but the technical distinction is that the Vatican city-state is the piece of land that is a country in a modern sense, and the Holy See is the bureaucracy that operates within it. So that, for instance, if one day the Italian government were to decide to reclaim all of the territory of the Vatican, the bureaucracy of the church could get on a plane with the Pope and you know, come over to um, San Francisco and, and, <laughs> and operate the church from here, and that would still be the Holy See. Um, this, so each one of those has its own uh, accounting ledger, and they do run a balance sheet on both of them. The Vatican city-state is, uh, the, the Holy See always runs a deficit. It runs a deficit because um, Vatican Radio, in particular, sucks up a huge amount of money. I don't know if you know this, the Vatican has its own radio station. It, um, you can actually hear it. If you go search it on the internet, you can hear a live feed of Vatican Radio. Some of the shows are amazing, by the way. Cardinals arguing about soccer, it's, it, it's my <laughs> work. Um, so then there, the Vatican City State makes money from selling stamps, selling coinage. You'd think, you're selling money? But yes, they since Vatican coins are considered rare, they sell them to collectors. And then, of course, ticket sales from the Vatican museums. So that is the way they view their income. And then there is separately the mysterious Vatican Bank, which in this respect is very mysterious. They keep it off both balance sheets. <laughs> and the reason they do that is because they say all the investors, all the people who have bank accounts there are not, I mean, it's a few Vatican employees, but mainly it's um, you know, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, they will have a, an enormous bank account there, or many of them. The Dominicans will have a bank account there. Each order, each religious order, will have its own bank account there. There are also thousands of illegal bank accounts there, but um, they don't consider that their money either, even though all the profit from it goes into the Pope's pocket. The size of the Vatican Bank, though, compared to American banks, is very small. It really doesn't hold that much money. It's, it's, a, it's a few billion dollars, and the amount of money that um, the Pope takes out of it every year is probably in the tens of millions. And a lot of that he just funnels into charities, uh, Catholic charities around the world. Mm. So the real wealth then of the Vatican is the stuff that we all see whenever we visit the Vatican. It's They own the Sistine Chapel, they own the Vatican Museum, they own the Apollo Belvedere, they own you know, St. Peter's itself. Uh, not a bad piece of real estate. So this is where a lot of the disagreement lies. 
people will look at those things and say, well, why, don't, why does the church need that stuff? That's worth billions and billions of dollars. And the Pope's answer is, well, I don't, what, are we going to sell it and just give the money away? And some people's answer would be, yeah. yes, that's exactly what we're going to do. In fact, there are days when I think Pope Francis is that close to saying that's what we're going to do. Um, but so that's from a Vatican point of view, that's their view of their own financial situation. Um, I think I came into this thinking that it was this mystical, immense sum of money that, that it was worth that they were worth. And then when I compared it to the amounts of money that are thrown around in the American economy, it's it actually ends up seeming a little bit trivial, sadly. Wow. Yeah. yeah. The uh, the entire amount of money I think in the Vatican Bank is at one point I compared it to Notre Dame's endowment, and Notre Dame's endowment has done a lot better over time than the Vatican <laughs> Bank has. Yeah. Why? That's thank you, Ian. This is sure, sure. <laughs>